Yes, listen, y'all. You have been cautioning. This message is coming for scalps. It's coming for necks. It's coming for big toes. It's coming for lives. This word is coming for your soul. I hope you guys are ready for this. We are in this brand new cuffin season series, and I'm telling you, on tonight, <laughs> like, go ahead and share the link. Share the link with a brother. Share the link with a sister. And let people know, listen, it is time. Yep, yo, time to make that change. It is time, and I am excited. And I firmly believe that we have a word customized by heaven just for you, 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 and you. Can I get everybody to drop the comment in the room? I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. And I'm thankful that you are joining me on tonight as we are about to launch a word that I believe is a now word. Take your screenshot, tag us, let us know where you are in the world. And I pray that you guys are ready and you are prepared. If you are those individuals who tag us and you got your Bible and you got your notes, one girl was like, Jerry, I have six pages of notes and I had to just pause. I'm not even done with the message yet. So I hope that you are ready for tonight's message. Our foundational scripture, our foundational text is in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, I really have been studying um, outside of this series on Genesis chapter 2 and it's just bleeding over. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to launch our reading at verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Let me pause right quick because I believe a lot of my sisters are caught up on receiving Adam, but you're not caught up on the part where God says, I will make. Until God makes you, you won't be suitable for what he is about to send to you. Somebody say, make me. It's not about just getting Adam. It's about receiving the process of being made. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man God is good just Adam woke up to a flawless beautiful naked woman you go God like God just knows God just knows Adam woke up and was like whoa man I think that's how she got her name woman our clause of concern and our verse of consideration and where we are going to pack and dissect this particular word on tonight lives in verse 15 then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. God, you're awesome. We are in high expectation of what you're going to do on tonight. Please allow this message to go beyond the retina display, to go beyond the tablets, go beyond the pads, and touch the hearts of your people. And as my typical request, oh God, please anoint me and empower me to be your oracle. The PA system of heaven, the soundtrack of heaven, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you drop the comment in the room? Amen. Amen. For this particular message, you do not have the right to remain silent. Amen. 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 The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it 
and to take care of it. There is so much intel and information that I have to share with you on tonight, so I just want to get straight to work. I would like to speak around this thought from this subject for the time that we have together on tonight. A man is ready when? A man is ready when? Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, just a few days ago, a few days ago, you and I both had the privilege of boarding the cruise line of this new sermon series entitled Cuffing Season. Cuffing Season. It is a season that derives from October the 1st to February the 14th. I'm not making this up. If you actually were to Google it, Cuffing Season is from October to the Valentine's type of season. And I felt led to do this particular series, and I felt led to do this particular message because for the next few weeks, I want to give you some spiritual nutrients. I want to give you some spiritual nutrients that is an investment in your soul care. Because around this time of year, when the wind gets brisk and the pumpkin spice is being extended and the holidays are upon us, I want us to make healthy, holistic, kingdom, purpose-benefiting choices. Purpose-benefiting choices that are an investment in our soul care. In layman's terms, I don't want us to make a choice in this season that gives birth to a season. Did y'all hear what I just said? I don't want us to make a choice in this season that gives birth to a season because every choice is pregnant with the potential to give birth to a season. And the sobriety of my choices is married to the health of my soul. I need to say that one more time. Every season, every choice is pregnant with the potential to give birth to a season. And the sobriety of my choices is married to the health of my soul. And I want us to make choices that reflects our growth and our healing, not choices out of frustration and brokenness. I want us to make choices that reflects our healing and our becoming process. And I want to bring this back to your remembrance. In our foundational text, we see that God put Adam to sleep and then he took out a rib. God put Adam to sleep and then he took out of a rib, took out a rib. Please pay attention. This is exposing a methodology of God. God put Adam to sleep. And then he took out a rib. I'm going to say it one more time just in case somebody got a notification on their phone and it distracted them. God put Adam to sleep. And then he took out a rib. This is important because it lets us know that God performs the best surgeries, which brings forth the biggest blessings when we have learned how to rest. <laughs> Preach Holy Spirit. God performs the best surgeries, which brings forth the biggest blessings when we have learned how to rest in him. And I don't know who I'm talking to on tonight, but I wonder, have you allowed the cares of this life to rob you of your rest? I wonder, have you allowed what you see to rob you of your rest? And for some of us, God cannot perform surgery because for him to perform surgery, you must be asleep and you're not resting. You're not resting in him. You're not resting due to the bills. You're not resting due to the pandemic. You're not resting due to the anxiety. You're not resting due to the typhoon of emotions that is just swirling in your soul. It is going back and forth in your mind. And I came here on tonight to let somebody know that God has scheduled a surgical operation for you. Somebody dropped a comment. You have an appointment. You have an appointment. You have an appointment. God has scheduled a surgical operation just for you. He wants to deal with your fractured soul. He wants to deal with your fears and, and your doubts. God wants to deal with what happened to your heart after they betrayed you. But I can't deal with it as long as you got the knife in your hand trying to be your own surgeon. Because you cutting the wrong things, you cutting the wrong parts, you cutting the wrong scriptures, you cutting the wrong people, you cut, oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. You're not the surgeon. I need to be the surgeon. I need to be the surgeon. If we could learn how to rest in the promises of God, 
If, if we could truly learn how to rest in the fact that God is not going to let you drown. He is humanity's lifeguard. He is not going to let you drown. If we can rest in the fact that as long as you have a pulse, God still has a plan. If we can rest in the fact that God did not bring you this far just so that you could come this far. If we can rest in the fact that God is a God who cannot lie. See, listen, the same God who provided breakfast for the sparrow this morning is the same God who provided water for the soil this afternoon. Surely he's the same God that could calm the storm in your soul on tonight I need to say that again the same God who provided breakfast for the sparrow this morning is the same God who provided water for the soil this afternoon is the same God who could surely calm the storm in your soul somebody say he's the same God he's the same God the same God that did this is the same God that's gonna do that God put Adam to sleep and then he took out a rib because God performs his best surgeries which brings forth the biggest blessings once we have learned how to rest in him hmm. allow him to be your surgeon not you God put Adam to sleep and then he took out of a rib took out a rib and then this is important he closed the wound See, now listen, I touched on this before, but I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. God put Adam to sleep, and then after he put Adam to sleep, he took out a rib, and then he closed the wound. If you look at this at the end of verse 21, at the end of verse 21 of our foundational text, then closed up the place with flesh. Listen, this is important because if God would not have closed that wound, it would have gave space for an infection. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist, it doesn't take a preacher, and it doesn't take somebody who has more degrees than a thermostat to recognize there are some men walking around infecting people. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Listen, certain parts of this message, the brother's going to be feeling me. And then other parts of the message, brother's not going to like me. And then certain parts of this message, the sister's going to be yes. And then other parts of this message, sister's going to be like my scalp. Listen. <laughs> I know I'm not the only one that has noticed a lot of us are being infected because there's a wound in a man that God has not closed. Listen to me, y'all. Listen, listen. He may be fine, but he has a wound. And until God closes it, you will get infected. He could be your type, but until God closes the wound, he has a wound that's open that could possibly become your infection. This man could be one that has you kiki keying all night on the phone, and he just makes you laugh, and he's so silly, he's so stupid, but there's an open wound there. And until God closes that wound, you risk being infected. Your pastor, yep, I just went there. Your pastor, even him, even they could have an open wound. It's just the pastor knows how to hide the wound behind the these, the thuses, and the thous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pastor, like we just know how to hide it behind biblical articulation and exegesis. But God knows there's a wound in this individual. And if God doesn't close that wound, he will end up bleeding on his sermon content, which is why every one of his sermons sounds like he's venting. Because there's a wound that God needs to close. I'm trying to get us to understand there's some wounds in daddy that God needs to close. There's some wounds in our sons that God needs to close. There's some wounds in our uncles that God needs to close. There's some wounds in our nephews that God needs to close. There's some wounds in our cousins that God needs to close. There's some wounds in our husband that God needs to close because if he doesn't, you will never be able to be this man's wife you will only be his nurse which is why the majority of your conversations end up into therapy sessions <laughs> you not bae you his therapist why y'all looking at me like that <laughs> why y'all looking at me like that this is why every time y'all talk it ends up into you rendering therapy and I'm trying to get you to understand allow God to perform surgery allow God to give him therapy before you call him baby Allow God to give him some therapy or else this whole relationship will feel like a therapy session. <laughs> Listen, I, I think this many times can be difficult for my sisters 
It's because God has wired you to be a helper. Listen, God has wired you and has built you to be a helper. In other words, anytime a woman walks in the room, help just walk in the room. God has wired you to make things level up. God has wired to make things level up. Your corporation levels up due to your presence. That community levels up due to your presence. That school levels up due to your presence. That, that entity levels up due to your presence because you have been wired by God to be a helper. But listen now, you have to understand your value and you have to have discernment because every broken man is not your rescue mission. Every broken person, see, listen, if you don't understand this, you will confuse your contribution as confirmation. Every broken individual is not your rescue mission. You have been given oil for who you're assigned to. You have not, given, you have not been given oil to your preference. Need to say that again. You have been given oil means you are anointed to help who God has assigned for you to help. You are not anointed to help who your preference wants you to help. And I have a sneaky suspicion that there's somebody watching this message right now and you're wounded and you're hurt because you tried to help a walking question mark. <laughs> you tried to help a walking question mark, which is why all of his sentences go like this. I don't know. 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 Man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Listen, I've been around enough brothers and in enough counseling sessions and had counseling administered to me and have been around a community of men to recognize sometimes when a man says, I don't know, he's not talking about what you just asked him. He, he's not saying, I don't know, to what you just asked. I don't know is his state. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what a man looks like. I don't know what kingdom looks like. I don't know who I am. And the reason you are so frustrated is because you are expecting a period from a walking question mark. God is the author and finisher of our faith, which means God is the only one that has editorial rights. Why do you keep trying to edit this brother? You need God to be his editor. Y'all not talking to me. <laughs> Y'all not talking to me. Listen, you're frustrated. Because you are expecting a period from a walking question mark. And I need all my sisters watching this to understand. Every time you open yourself up to a man, he's not just penetrating your body. He's penetrating your soul. And the reason you can't get him out your head is because you keep letting him in your bed. Are y'all ready for this? This is cuffing season. Y'all ready for this? <laughs> Y'all ready for this? God has wired for you to be a helper. I need you to understand that you are the favor factor. Did you hear what I just said? You are the favor factor. So why do you feel as though a man coming in your life brings you favor? That's not biblical. You are the favor factor. You are the carrier of favor. He who finds a wife findeth a good thing and obtain favor from the Lord. And I hear you. Somebody watching this message is like, but I'm not married, though. <laughs> I'm not married, though. Listen, you are a wife before you are a wife. That part, though. You are a wife before you are a wife. How is it you're looking to say I do to a man more than you say I do to God? You are a wife before you are a wife. So your attachment is favored, whether you somebody's or not. You can be single and favored. You can be married and favored. I wish I had some brothers in this sanctuary who would holler back at your boy because you know ever since your wife came into your life, ever since that sister came into your life, there is some favor that you have received. You are looking at a man who has received favor from God and I firmly believe is tied to my wife. Favor. The reason many times I think my sisters get tripped up is because you're wired to help. But a lot of us have been trying to help your preference versus help your purpose. And, and, and for my brothers watching this, all my kings watching this, all my warriors watching this, I want you to know that God has wired and he has manufactured us to be protectors. He has wired for us to be protectors, a protector. One of the manliest things that you could ever do, one of the most masculine things that you could ever do is protect her purity and protect her spirit.
And listen, I know this may not be preached much, but just because it's not being preached doesn't mean it has ever stopped being biblical. You are called to be the head, not play with their head. You are a protector. You are a protector of your name. You are a protector of your bloodline. You are a protector of your inheritance. You are a protector of your sons. You are a protector of your daughters. You are a protector of your wife. You are a protector. Can I get somebody to say protector? Let me tell you something. Let me put you on game real quick. One of the ways that you can identify if a man really loves you, it's not by him giving flowers to you. That's nice. That's cute, bro. It's not about her. It's not about him giving you chocolate and that good morning text. That's cute. It's not about him just providing for you. One of the ways that you can really tell if a man loves you is if he protects you. Because whatever a man loves, he protects. If he really loves his car, he may wash his car and put a protective cover on it or even protective seat covers because whatever a man loves, he protects. If he loves his guns, he can have a vault with combinations, two or three chains on it because he loves what's inside that vault. Whatever a man loves, he protects. Our father's the same way. God loved you and he loves me so much that he gave his son to die on the cross for the remission of our sins. And he rose on the third day with all power in his hands. He has the keys to, of hell and of death. The devil doesn't even have the keys to his own home, y'all. That's how much of a boss God is. He led captivity captive and he set us free. Why? Because he loves us and he wanted to protect us from wrath. And I have a sneaky suspicion that there's somebody watching this message that you know I'm preaching good because God has protected you from some stuff. There's some bullets that you should have got hit by, but God protected you. There's some things that should have took you out, but God protected you. There's some STDs. Y'all don't want to talk. There's some stuff that you should have contracted, but God protected you. Can I get somebody to drop the comment in the room? He's a protector. He's a protector. Whatever a man loves, he protects. And God has wired us to be a protector. And one of the ways that you can protect her is by protecting her spirit. How about for starters, you can protect her spirit by not entertaining other spirits. Because you can't ask God for a Ruth while sexing Jezebel. Lord have mercy. You can't ask God for a Ruth while sex and Jezebel. We are called to walk around and hump everything, and then you want a crown? My brother, right now you deserve a collar. God has wired us to be a protector and have self-control. Self-control. <laughs> I feel like y'all look at me like, oh, we, man. Oh, we. Listen, I just firmly believe, I firmly believe that kingdom men have a minor's work ethic. King, king, kingdom men have a minor's worth ethic, worth ethic. And somebody's probably watching this message like, listen, where they at though? <laughs> where they at though? Let me know where they at though. Listen, never allow the lack of exposure to make you doubt the existence of a thing. You never seen a koala bear, but you believe they exist. Kings still roam among us. Never allow the lack of of your exposure to make you doubt the existence of a thing. God has his kingdom men, and I firmly believe that kingdom men has a minor's work ethic. When I met my wife, yeah, there was some dirt, but the dirt didn't deter me because I knew that there's gold under this. I knew there's value under this. I knew there's gold and there's diamonds and there's riches under this. There's riches in a personality. There's riches in her heart, and it's my job to love her so much so that she'll forget her heart was ever broken kingdom men can I get somebody to say kingdom kingdom men I feel like this is like roundhouse kicking somebody in the neck bone you're like why are you preaching so passionate it's because I think the church has done a disservice I think the church has done a disservice I've been in several summits conferences revivals you name it and it seems as though a lot of the messages are geared towards the emotions in women. It's, it seems as though a lot of the messages want an emotional response. And then we have ministries who are making monetization off your trauma. They monetize off your trauma, male bashing messages, 
And I've come to just set the record straight, and I believe we need more sermons like this to remind the men of God, listen, brother, you, you, you are wired to be a king. And remind the ladies, you are the favor factor, and you are a divine helper. But I have to have wisdom to know who and where I should help. I have to look at the garden. Listen, until this brother has ran into the king in the garden, until this brother has had a collision course with the lion out of the tribe of Judah, until this brother has waved the white flag of surrender, he ain't ready. I didn't say he's not. I said he ain't. Put some ebonics on them boys. Them boys is Houston terminology. He ain't ready. <laughs> he ain't ready. Uh, until he has had an encounter with the king in the garden. Until he has had a collision course encounter with the lion out of the tribe of Judah. Until he has waved his white flag of surrender. I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm not saying that he won't have flaws. I'm not saying that he won't have issues. And there's still some maturing that he has to do. I'm not saying that those things are evaporated. I'm saying to the best of this man's capability, he has surrendered his life to God. Listen, I'm trying to surrender my will for your will. I'm trying to surrender my way for your way. I'm trying to surrender my thoughts for your thoughts. I don't have it perfect, but I'm seeking a perfect God to change me. I'm seeking for a perfect God to change me. Until then, he ain't ready. See, listen, church family. I believe one of the most painful things to hit the human heart one of the most painful things to hit the human heart is to be deceived. I'm, I'm talking about deception, deception, tricked, manipulated, tricked, played, however you want to name it. Deception is that gut punch. It is that gut punch that knocks the wind out of our soul. And it has our soul constantly trying to catch our breath ever since we learned that. Ever since we discovered that, ever since we found out that. See, listen, when you have the revelation that what you thought was genuine was really artificial, when a person discovers that what they thought was real was really fake, that has the propensity to callous our heart to love and to trust. Hmm. So now it makes so much sense. If one of the most painful things that can hit the human heart is, is, is to be deceived, no wonder the devil traffics in deception. Because the residue of being deceived is distrust. And the main quality for the Christian is to be able to trust. Are y'all seeing how this connects? One of the most painful things to hit my heart is when I am deceived. But the enemy traffics in deception because he knows the residue of deception is for me to have distrust. But trust is the main attribute that a Christ follower must have. So anytime the enemy tries to deceive us, it's really a war move on our trusting ability. It's a war move on our ability to trust. And how he trips us up many times is by light glimpses. I want you to see this, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 14. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masqueraders as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of the light. I believe how the enemy trips us up is by light glimpses. So what happens is you meet this brother, you think that this might be the one. I don't know why, you know, we go there instead of trying to be friend first. It's, could this be my husband? We're going to unpack that later <laughs> throughout this cuffing season series. But when you meet him, God shows you a red flag, but then the enemy, boom, shows you a light glimpse. And then you see another red flag, you're like, well, I don't really know. Boom, you see a light glimpse. And then you're like, well, I'm really praying. God shows you a red flag. Boom. You see a light glimpse. It's those light glimpses that get us confused. Because listen, it's the spurts of you could do better that messes us up. Y'all not talking to me. It's the spurts that he really does have a good heart that messes us up. It's the spurts that he really is kind. But I'm trying to get you to understand that bipolar leadership gives birth to confusion. 
You're confused because it's bipolar. <laughs> it's bipolar. God shows you a red flag. The enemy shows you a light glimpse. And I want us to have discernment so much so to where we're not deceived anytime the angel comes. The enemy comes as an angel of the light. But we're so in tune with God where we're like, God, if you didn't send this, I don't want it. Is there anybody who got to that place in your life? If it ain't kingdom, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. So I'm going to give you a few points. How do you know a man is ready? Number one, a man is ready when he has a garden. <laughs> a man is ready when he has a garden. The garden is symbolic of intimacy with Jesus. Look at this. In our foundational text, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man. Pause. The Lord God took the man. What does that mean? This man has been captured by God. This man's mind has been captured by God. The Lord took the man. He has been Liam Neeson on them boys. If you don't know what Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson is like an actor in the movie Taken. Anyway, he has been taken by God. God has taken his mind. God has taken his passions. God has taken his thoughts. God has taken his ways. He's not all the way there yet. He's not Jesus Jr. or Paul Jr., but God has taken him and God has placed him in the garden. And what did he tell them to do in the garden? He said to work it. So then we see that after God places a man, after God introduces himself to this man, he gives this man identity. He gives him a job, a legal one. Like one you can file on your taxes. <laughs> he gives you a legal job. And then he says, take care of it. What does that mean? God makes him consistent. Oh, if you want to get on a woman's nerves, be inconsistent. I believe there are ladies that are like, I'd rather you be a consistent fool than for you to be inconsistently good. Like be one all the way. If you're going to be sorry, be consistent. If you're not going to call, be consistent. If you're going to be lame, be consistent. It's those light spurts. That messed us up. God placed him in the garden and he told him to work it and to take care of it. That means he's consistent. So listen, don't just go off his words, go off his garden. Don't just go off his body, it's all right. Go off his garden. Don't just go off how he makes you kiki kiki kiki. Don't just go off how he makes you laugh and y'all are so cool and you've known him since high school. I need you to look and notice his garden. Notice his relationship with the Lord because unmowed gardens give rooms for snakes. And then you wonder why you're getting bit by anxiety and you're, you're getting bit by depression and you're getting bit by your hair falling out and you're getting bit by trauma. It's because you didn't first look at the condition of his garden and you just walked over in the high grass because he was your preference. See, we need a preacher like this. We need a preacher like this where we can be informed what to look for and then also for men how to become. Number one, he has a garden. Number two, a man is ready when he takes responsibility. One thing my coach told me um, in middle school, own the fumble. Stop blaming the way they handed it to you. Stop blaming the way the QB threw it to you. Stop blaming how you got hit. Own the fumble. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'll do better. You're right. That's my fault. Those should not be ancient words. Those should not be words that are foreign. A kingdom man can acknowledge and take responsibility when he's wrong. Listen, God is always going to call Adam first. Always. In the garden, the first thing he said was, Adam, where are you? He, he's not playing hide and seek and, and Adam has found a real good hiding spot. He said, no, no, Adam, where are you in your mind that you thought you could choose something better than me? Where are you in your mind that you would allow your wife to be your test drive to see if once she ate the fruit, something happened? Nothing happened until Adam ate of the fruit because God is saying, listen, for kingdom men, everything on the side of you and under you is your responsibility. And biblical manhood is it may not be my fault, but it is my responsibility. Takes responsibility. One of the ways that you really know that you're a man is your ability to put things away. Look at this. I want us to see this. This is so good, y'all. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. A male is a state of birth. A man is a matter of choice. And one of the ways that you can really tell if you're a man is how well do you put things off? How well do you put away blaming people? How well do you put away not sharing? That's like elementary. Matter of fact, pre-K, sharing is caring. Sharing your wealth. Sharing your inheritance. Sharing your income. Sharing your influence. Sharing your feelings. Sharing your heart. How well have you put off and put away sin? Because one of the ways that you could tell how much of a man you really are is when you have put things away. What do you have in your life that comforted you since you were a boy? Do you still throw temper tantrums when you don't get your way? That's childish. Do you still give the silent treatment when something doesn't go your way? That's childish. When you get angry, do you still hit walls and kick stuff? That's childish. My four-year-old son, we're trying to get him out of doing that. <laughs> yeah, when you're a man, I put away childish things. Next way. You can identify when a man is ready. Number three, he can provide. He can provide you with clarity. He ain't never going to be like, yeah, let's just see what happens. You know what I mean? Let's just see. Let's just see, you know, how time takes his course. No, he's going to provide you with clarity. <laughs> if marriage is the goal, it's going to be clear. You're not going to be the one that has to keep on bringing up purity. You're not going to be the one that has to keep on bringing up the altar. If that is his goal, he's going to provide you with clarity. Somebody say clarity. Provide you with clarity. He's going to provide you with vision. He's going to provide you with the destination. Provide you with food, shelter, and clothing. That's like basic, right? <laughs> but a lot of men, unfortunately, we have been mothered to death. We have been mothered to death. So we're not looking for wife. We're looking for mama, which is why we want to live with you, which is why we want to drive your car, which is why we want you to take care of us. We have been mothered to death. All ladies watching this, watch the way you mother your sons because that is a king in the making. That is a king in the making, and we have too many men already today walking around looking for mama. Listen, true manhood is when you get off of mama's breast and on your wife's breast. You know, it is Bible, right? The Bible says enjoy the breast of your wife. Like, just enjoy it. That's Bible. Why y'all looking at me like that? <laughs> the Bible says that. Enjoy the breast of your wife. She's your young doe. <laughs> Bible all day. I cannot be in daddy's wallet and on mama's breast. That's not manhood. Manhood is when I have provision and I can provide not just for myself, but for somebody else. Number four, I know I'm walking heavy, but I just feel as though my generation needs this. Don't worry, ladies, we coming for you. My wife's going to join me. We're going to talk about drama queen. I hope you're ready for that one. Um, number four, he is ready when he listens. Listen, if a wife is a helper. This means your evolution is tied to your ability to listen. God said it is not good for men to be alone. I will create him a helper suitable for him. You're going to have to be able to have a man you're going to have to be able to be a man that can listen to the counsel of your woman, of your wife. Now, listen, ladies, this means you have to get control of your emotions so that when you speak, you're able to speak out of help versus speaking out of hurt. What is the condition of your mouth? Because I know you're like, yeah, you know, I agree with that. Okay, is your mouth have the condition to help him? Because his evolution process is tied to your words. Do you just go off? You know, the Bible says it's better for him to be on the roof. Then in the house with a quarrelsome wife, I'm thinking like, God, Lee, you're not considering the seasons. It could be winter. It could be the summertime, 110 degrees. It is better for you sitting outside on your roof with this towel burning your backside than for you to be in the house with a quarrelsome wife. What is the condition of your mouth, ma'am? Because if you want him to listen, your mouth has to be able to spew forth evolution. And I can't give evolution if I'm still in destruction. This is so good, y'all. <laughs> the well-being and welfare of a man is tied to whoever has access to his ear because we are all a byproduct of the level of teaching we sit under. 
And I think the problem with our generation is we have too many of the wrong professors in our ears. Number five, a man is ready when he wars for self-control. Self-control, self-control. It's not cute that when he gets angry, he punches stuff. That could be your face one day. That doesn't mean that he's, oh, he's so manly. He's, he's such a protector. Because, you know, back in the day, I don't really think it's there anymore. But back in the day, ladies used to like bad boys. Bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? What you going to do when they come for you? You used to like bad boys? <laughs> and you thought that him having anger, being able to fight, was protection because daddy didn't protect you? No. That shows a lack of control. That shows a misuse of anger. And be careful because anger is one letter short of danger. Self-control. And the last one, point number five, a man is ready when he has been in the refiner's fire. And I, I think what I want us to understand is that we have to allow God to make him. And that's okay. I don't know why. We, we, we view it as um, I'm ready, they should be ready. God has to build him. Before Eve ever came along on the scene, Adam had time with God. Like Adam knew God so much so that after the fall of man, after the fall of man, Adam was able to identify God's sound walking through the garden. He didn't mistake it for an elephant. He didn't mistake it for a giraffe. He was so close to God where he knew the rhythm and the tempo of God's walk. He was close with God. And I think we have to allow space for God to make him. See, what happens is we have this dude, right, that comes in our life and God has all of these ingredients. All of these ingredients because he's going to make him. And so God's like, all right, I'm going to make you, bro. I got to pour grace on the inside of you. I got to pour a vision on the inside of you. And a lot of us, you're coming when this man is just in the flower phase. And you wonder why your relationship keeps getting messy. It's because he's not done yet. And then some of us come when a man is in the butter phase. He's not done yet. Allow God to put it together. And God's trying to give him salt. He's trying to give him provision. He's trying to give him gentleness. He's trying to give him self-control. This is not ready yet. This is not ready yet, but just because you see the potential of what this could become doesn't mean give in to it because he still has to submit to being cooked. He still has to commit to being baked. God has so many things that he wants to pour on the inside of men. There's so many principles that he wants to pour on the inside of men. And there are a lot of things that come in our life that we thought this was a good thing. And God says, no, I got to break this. I got to break this because of what I'm making you. And you come into the life of this man and you'll be thinking, okay, he's ready. Okay, it's time. This is a mess right now. This is a mess, but you have to allow God to stir him. You have to allow God to make him. You have to allow God to build him because of what he's going to be. And then after I'm stirring him, and I have to crush this because there's still some pride. And I have to crush this because there's still some jealousy. And I have to crush this because there's still some abandonment issues. Allow me to stir my word in him. Allow me to stir purpose in him. Allow me to stir vision in him before you ever try to glean from him. And then God has to put this man in the fire because in the fire, that's when things rise. I know it's messy up here, but God uses mess to send messengers. God uses mess to introduce us to the Messiah. God puts him in the fire because fire causes for things to rise. That fire calls for that king to rise. That fire calls for that prayer life to rise. That fire calls for that worship to rise. That fire calls for that commitment to rise. If he's not in the fire, it won't rise. And what brothers we have to do is to make sure we don't eat stuff too soon. We don't eat stuff too soon. Allow God to build you. Allow him to mold you. Allow him to shape you. Forget what culture's saying. Culture is not concerned about the things of the Lord. We have to be kingdom men. Well, I'm submitting to the process. I'm submitting to the process. And we have to be ladies. That just because you see the potential doesn't mean join the process. Allow God to make him in the garden. Allow God to perform surgery because it is not your job. It is not your job or your responsibility to fix a broken man because you are not called to engage in rescue mission or missionary dating or missionary marriage. So God would, 
Would you give us understanding? Would you give us an outlook to understand that you have built us, you have wired us, and we need more kingdom men in the earth. Our churches need it. Our homes need it. Our sons need it. Our daughters need it. The world needs more kingdom men. And would you condition us to stay in the process? Be our chef. It doesn't matter how messy it gets. It doesn't matter the things that you have to break. Stir in me the word. Stir in me passion. Stir in me hope. Stir in me clarity. So that eventually you could put me in a fire. So that I could be served to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.